Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be, and welcome to a reading of one of my novels. This is part of the Alex Strange saga. It's called My Beautiful Boat, Don't Look Back, Pussycat, Kill, Kill. And each book in this, at least the first three books, give different perspectives on a similar chain of events, but they are all quite different. This one is aimed at a more of an adult audience, whereas the second book in the series is aimed at a younger audience, and the first one is for everybody, but it's a little bit unconventional. So this one is meant to be lighthearted, fun, um, my attempt to write from a man's perspective. <laughs> it was the first day of the rest of my life, and bittersweet doesn't even begin to describe it. I'd emptied out my bank account and bought the boat. Not more than three hours later, I went to my 17-year-old daughter's graduation. On our way back home, she screamed at me. I hate you. You're the worst father ever. She even threw my phone at me. But like everything in those days, the words came through in muted form. The wire my employer had installed in my head had changed the volume of my life to the point that, emotionally, I was either numb or homicidal. Every time I had to go to the city, I imagined going on an axe-wielding rampage, chopping through walls and people at every turn. I dreamed of having a laser beam that would decapitate everyone in the train. I wanted a hammer to smash all of the glass entrance atria at the transit hubs. I was not doing well. Perhaps the, lay the fault lay with the personalized ads. Joe Strange, you are missing something important in your life. Joe Strange, haven't you ever wanted more out of your life? Joe Strange, we have the perfect solution for you. My daughter, Alex, had never been exposed to this level of intrusion. She didn't know what she was asking for when she asked me to pay for her to go to college. Ever since she was a little girl, she had dreamed of the glamour of city life and academia, and I was no match for the sorts of fantasy systems filling her little head. I'd spent my entire career counseling people like her after they'd been chewed up by the system and spit out. Rather, I didn't really do the counseling. The AI did that. I just managed the email system through which their mental breakdowns were catalogued and sent to the proper authorities for further management. I was supposed to make sure that the AI wasn't doing crazy things, but the truth was that I barely paid any attention to the words that flowed across my screen. It was really too painful to engage with, and after a few years, Everyone's tragedies looked the same to me. This godlike knowledge of intimate thoughts was not meant for people like me. It tore me apart, the sameness of everyone's hopes, dreams, and heartaches. How could I be an ind individual while all of these people on my screen are exactly the same? When I was shooting for a promotion, I'd intervene a bit. Marriage is hard, I'd commiserate. I've often wondered how different my life would be if I'd regularly picked my dirty underwear up off of the floor. I hate her and wish she were dead, he'd reply. This was my cue to forward the case to the potential homicide division. I soon realized that the AI did a better job at sorting cases than I did, and that a hands-off approach was best. I compartmentalized and let the automation do the majority of the thinking tuning out as, as much as possible and trying to create a space to remember the good things in my life. I remembered falling in love with my wife, Alex's mother. It was I was such a different person back then, an eccentric and a real charmer. When she loved me, I felt like the world had told me I was okay. I was the man I was supposed to be. But when she stopped loving me, I was nothing. That was when I gave myself to my job in the city. 
Before I gave up and let the city have its way with my mind in exchange for money, my life was so confusing, but it was still a life. For a while, I blamed baby Alex for my confusion and for my wife's anger. She was always tottering around and absorbing everyone's attention when our attention was already stretched as far as it could go. Her mother was always so tired and angry with me. There was never enough money, and that was all she ever talked about. When I boarded my new boat, I brought a copy of the poem I wrote for her when I was falling in love with her. It was a symbol of the man I used to be and wanted to be again. Chapter 2. Puppies When I sailed away from the city with my fishing gear and several months' worth of supplies, I knew very little about surviving on the ocean. I had a paper book about sailing, but all I really knew was that I was happy to be getting away from the automated email system that my employer had installed in my head. For years, it had been sending me messages non-stop, and now that it was deactivated, I was struggling to remember how to think like I did back when I was young. Every day on the boat was consumed with the requirements of nature. I was watching the wind and the currents, getting a feeling for how to extract the maximum speed from any given situation. There were days at the beginning when I would sail all day with a strong wind, only to realize that I'd moved further away from my goal, swept off course by a strong current. At night, I'd study the stars and learn about how people navigated back in the days before technology. The first step was to identify the North Star. Then I'd find the Southern Cross. From that, I could determine my latitude and longitude. It was actually a, actually a lot more complicated than that, and I had a, to get a sense of how the constellations moved across the sky with the changing seasons. I studied physics and mathematics and thought about how much I wanted to talk about what I'd learned with Alex. She'd always loved those topics. Alex would have been in college around that time, and I worried a lot about her a lot. I told her to stay close to home and develop a craft rather than go off to the city and plug herself into one of their systems. She didn't listen, of course. I'd been sailing towards warmer waters, avoiding the continents and the bot scuppers that patrolled the coasts, when I came upon a desert island and decided to make my first landing. I saw date palms and coconut trees, so I looked forward to getting some fresh food and vitamin C. I had supplements, but the real thing is always better. <clears throat> that was when I met Fluffy. She was a medium-sized poodle-like dog with cream-colored dreadlocks, and she looked extremely hungry and pregnant. I gave her a bunch of leftover fish, and she ate like she hadn't been fed in days. She was also very thirsty. "'Whose dog is this?' I asked for the first person I met. He was a scraggly man who appeared to be scratching out a living from gathering whatever food he could find growing in the wild. "'Nobody's dog. Your dog,' he said. She'll be eaten if you don't take her. I traded some fish for fruit, and Fluffy followed me back to the boat. She needed a haircut. I helped her on board, being careful to avoid swishing her pregnant belly, and we set sail. I had not anticipated the amount of dog poop I would be dealing with over the coming months, but figuring out how to keep the puppies alive really kept me busy and kept my mood up. Chapter 3. Pirates Right around the time that the puppies weaned was when I ran into Captain Blackbeard's pirate armada and began to understand a bit more about global politics. Back in the cities of Wonderland and Neverland, the media narratives were so controlled that no one had any idea what was going on in the wider world. But out on the open ocean, tall tales of distant lands were the currency of the day. The pirates boarded my little sailboat and installed a little transponder in the bow so that my boat could serve as part of their bot scupper surveillance apparatus. Can I have a puppy? asked the shy pirate who was tasked with installing my transponder. Of course, you can take all of them. They've all weaned. 
Hey, boys, he yelled. We've got puppies. I was invited on to the mothership, the Queen Anne's Revenge, and treated to a nice rum cocktail. Mai Tai Ro A, it is Hawaiian for out of this world, he said. It is delicious, I said. Rum, curacao, or giat, limes, and oranges. I learned the recipe back in Takatuka land. Not Hawaii? Nope, Takatuka land. I've heard it is nice. I'd like to go someday. You should. Have you been to Wonderland lately? I haven't been able to keep up with the news. I completely unplugged, I said. Yeah, they've got a machine, you know, at the laboratory, and a lot of people are complaining that it makes their minds hum. Hum? Like a low-frequency buzz. Can't they shield it? Not that I know of. I had to get out of that place for other reasons. It felt like living in a house of cards. I know what you mean. The first time you have to... The first time you have the time to really study all of the systems that hold the economy together, it all seems so fragile, but then you realize that it's always been like that, and you relax a bit. <laughs> you just don't want to be there when the ball drops. Slip and stick. It's a sticky system, a sticky situation. Where is the situation not sticky, I asked trying to clean my tie off of my trousers. When I figure it out, I'll let you know. After a long chat with a few of Blackbeard's pirates, I was enchanted with the idea of visiting the new Aztec nations of the Americas. They said that new pyramids had been built and that the music they played was unlike anything I'd ever heard before. They attempted to do a rendition of one of the foreign songs with some drums and a flute, but I was assured that the real deal was ten times better, and to watch the women dance to the songs was worth the trip. In time, I would hear those songs firsthand and watch the women dance. I would learn to play those songs and teach them to others. Chapter 4 Intrusive Memories what surprised me the most about this time in my journey was how horny I'd become and how much these thoughts drowned out my lust for adventure. The pleasant memories I kept returning to were of my ex-wife and of the sorts of women who liked divorced men like me, who worked in the city. I met a few nice ladies right after my divorce. The memories I hated were of 3D porn pumped right into my film implant. They were addictive, intrusive, and mixed together with a horrible memory of the time my boss's crazy teenage daughter threw herself at me and tried every porn move in the book. I was recovering from a suicide attempt when she took off all of her clothes and climbed on top of me. The stunning desperation for attention and lack of intimacy of that encounter represented everything that was rotten about the city in one rancid teen nutshell. Don't get me wrong, I got off, but the memory itself is gross and shameful. Another rotten but not completely rancid memory that kept returning to me was something that happened shortly before I got my boat and left the cities. In fact, it was the event that made the purchase of my boat possible, and I probably liked remembering it because I was proud of it. I was scheduled to meet a woman in the park down the street from my apartment. It was a sunny, late summer afternoon. The flowers were in bloom, ducks waddled, and there she was, sitting on a park bench, waiting patiently for me with a book in her hand. What are you reading? I asked, leaning over to get a closer look at the book. I knew not to waste time. This was either going to happen or it wasn't, and she'd given me every indication that it was definitely going to happen. Oh, something old, she said, surprised by my brave encroachment on her personal space. I did it because I knew it worked. I pulled out a package of cigarettes and offered one to her. It always helps to know what a woman likes. This was too easy. The moment of truth was but seconds away. How do you like your toast and coffee in the morning? I asked. 
she blushed. Since she hadn't gotten out much in recent weeks, she was quite dressed up, sort of like a preppy girl from the early 1960s. Plaid, short skirt, tasteful sweater, but there was definitely something a bit slutty and desperate about the outfit. She was well over 30, but she looked like she was playing dress-up to look like a 20-year-old college student. Not that she ever went to college. She'd gotten a different type of work when she graduated from high school. An unusual sort of work. Blessed or cursed with an abnormally childish face and frame, throughout her teens and twenties, I was sure that she passed as an awkward, horse-faced twelve-year-old, and the government agency for which I worked knew how to make use of that sort of quality. Essentially, they'd used her as child bait in a series of string operations on pedophiles. She was quite lucky that nothing ever went wrong on any of these operations, and when she graduated from that job, she had a nice nest egg, a government employee husband minder, a cushy job, and no overly traumatic memories. Not everyone in her line of work was so lucky, and I hoped that no one ever tried to recruit Alex for that job. They usually made an offer that seemed impossible to refuse to a naive girl from the countryside. The biggest drawback of such work was that it led a young woman to conclude that she could use her body to get whatever she wanted, and what she wanted today was a good time. She was married, but her husband traveled a lot and didn't care that much if she went out once in a while to meet someone different. She'd married a security worker she'd met on one of her operations, and people of his profession were all rather loose about relationship issues. Monogamy just wasn't in their culture, since they were trained to have a hard time carrying about much of anything. Systematic trauma is very effective in achieving that end. Despite my depressing desk job reality, on paper I was an, on paper I was an elder of their tribe, and Due to a bit of blind luck and some ill-considered behavior at an office party, I had gotten a reputation for being a guy you could call up for a good time. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. This woman was overjoyed that I had called her to this meeting. She was anticipating a high. As she had developed a taste for some rather hard drugs and experiences during some of her operations. To me, she was just a high-end junkie that I needed to set in motion for a long-standing plan. My escape plan. I needed this woman to do something for me, and the best way I knew to get someone to do something was to seduce them, make their head swim with pleasure, and convince them that I liked them. I didn't mind this meeting at first, although her childish cell phone clicking was annoying, especially since it reminded me of Alex, and she didn't have anything interesting to say other than the standard-issue damsel-in-distress stuff that every woman says to get a man to invest in her. The situation is so scary. I hate being alone in my apartment all of the time. And with winter coming, it's going to be freezing since our windows have single-pane glass. My husband hasn't even gone sofa shopping with me. I mean, we've been living there for six months and we still don't have a sofa. He's been traveling almost constantly since we got married. Why don't you order one? A sofa? A sofa just seems like an important decision to make together, and it is nice to see them in the showrooms. I mean, it's the central element of a living room. The ex extended sex threw my back out, and the drugs gave me a splitting headache the next day, but I viewed it all as necessary to achieve an end and I was a bit concerned that she wouldn't be far enough under my spell to get the job done. This meant that I would need to call her on the phone, maybe even send flowers. I didn't care. Whatever worked, worked. This was what I told myself as I sat in the garden atrium of my residence compound at 5 a.m. while she slept in the apartment below. As I watched the sun come up, I thought about my scheme. I thought about my escape, and saw a strange shape in some smoke from a nearby ventilation port. It formed a shape I knew well, and I viewed it as an omen that I was on the right track. I was vaguely aware that the woman who was presently asleep in my bed was also scheming, 
hoping that I would do something for her in exchange for the unrestrained Viagra-enhanced access to her significantly younger body. She knew her worth in that market, but the payoff she wanted was in another. She wanted people to think she was smart and high status, because she wanted her less-than-attentive father's approval. She thought that my connections could help her achieve that. It must not have bothered her that much that she was trying to indirectly get her father's approval by sleeping with a man who was old enough to be her father and who had, on occasion, worked with her father. I didn't care. I had achieved my goal. Mind control over women like her was far too easy. When people are desperate for approval, they jump at the smallest bait. Despite the constant emails and advertisements that assaulted me every morning when I woke up and clocked in, I knew my value. My love was worth more than some little piece of bait. But I was, was I worthy of the future I envisioned, or was it worthy of me? For me, this calculation all depended on the marketplace, and I was trying to craft a trade that, I would, that would steal back my soul from the devil himself. If only it were so easy. She invited me over to her apartment, a cold, unfurnished space that hoped to be so much more. The sex was even less romantic in this environment, and for some reason my penis had developed some little red spots right around the base. I tried to get her to look at them, but she reacted badly. Don't touch me, she said, pulling away in disgust. Get that out of my face. Sorry, I'll go. I just thought you should know. I thought I saw some spots on you, too. She had also reacted badly to me joining her in the shower. I think it forced her to notice how much older I was than the guys she typically hooked up with. There are certain parts that get rather dangly with age, and I don't think she liked that. The next time I called her up, she said, I don't think I'm up for another meeting for a few weeks at least. I got a really bad UTI from you. But you can still do that thing I asked about, though, right? I asked. Yes, I'll do it, she said. Partners in crime. Sometimes love is what ties people together, and sometimes it is shame. In the end, my scheme worked, and I got my money. A little blackmail was a dangerous thing to play with if you're planning to stick around the city. But I wasn't planning to stick around. I got my boat, and I got my life back. At a cost. Once I left, I could never come back. Alex was on her own. Chapter 5. Remembrance of Things Past After a lengthy stretch alone at sea, I started thinking about my childhood and my parents. This is inevitable whenever one has a lot of time on one's hands. I found it easier to think about their lives if I cloaked their stories within a slightly fictional realm. This was the result. Dimbo Kugel was having an identity crisis. He worked up, woke up from a bad dream about pulling teeth from a dragon's mouth, and I looked over at his bedside table where there was a picture of himself at around age ten. He was holding a fish and smiling. On that day in history, his, his father had angrily packed the car with his three sons, some old fishing gear, and soggy sandwiches that his mother had made. There were moon pies, soda pop, and beer in the cooler as well. They were off to a late start, considering that the best fishing happened in the cool early morning hours, but this didn't stop their father from pulling over and taking a pit stop at his local bar. The bar had just opened for the day, and their dad went in to tank up while the boys waited outside in the hot car. After their dad stumbled back out and they had made some headway on their journey, the boys fought in the back seat, and this called for another pit stop during which their dad beat them with his belt. None of this was apparent in the photo of Dimbo and the fish. One could only see a ten-year-old boy proudly smiling for the camera with a fish. But it wasn't even his fish. 
They had borrowed it from a more successful fisherman. In any case, Jimbo Kugul had this photograph on his bedside table, at the request of his psychiatrist. The psychiatrist thought that having a picture of himself as a child would remind him of who he was at his core. But if Dimbo Kugel's core was defined by the little boy in that photo, he was not ever going to be a very happy person, even though the magic little pills prescribed by his psychiatrist had caused him to behave as a happy person might behave. Life had been so much simpler before the pills, before his wife insisted that he get his depression fixed. Before the magic pills entered his life, he worked, he slept, he ate, and everything had progressed according to his standard life goals. But now everything was different. He had always been a very introverted, shy person, and now, for the first time in his married life, he wanted to gossip. He followed his wife around as she folded laundry and cooked dinner and smeared cold cream on her face peppering her with a thousand questions about their children and their children's friends and their children's friends' parents. Dimbo, why do you suddenly care about all of this? You are acting so weird. I feel like I'm being interrogated by a complete stranger. You should tell your psychiatrist that I said that. He had always relied on women to tell him who he was, and now that his wife was telling him that he was a complete stranger, he was very confused. His mother had told him that he was a fat, greedy little bully. His wife had told him that he was a stoic John Wayne type, who was so manly that he didn't even remember her birthday. Twenty years later, she told him that he was a boring, depressed, asocial downer. Now she was telling him that he was a freak who didn't know who he was. Poor Jimbo. When his wife, Booby Buston, divorced him, he stopped taking the pills and replaced her with an identical copy, Busty Boobin. She was several years younger than the original, and she told him that he was John Wayne. I love disasters, and you have the air of disaster about you. It makes you seem appealingly dangerous, she said in a moment of rare introspective acuity. Dimbo Kugel and Busty were about to get the surprise of their lives. And I will stop reading now. Or I'll skip ahead. So, the conclusion of this little look back, this retrospective, is I felt a lot of guilt over not finding my father after the cataclysm. Chapter 6 Joining a Cult. I was getting rather lonely on my boat, and this led me to venture on shore and join a cult. Some might think that joining a cult is always a terrible idea, but for me it was the right thing at the right time. I had a number of cults to choose from. There were <laughs> the rocket building cults and the death ray building cults that were subsidized by the green people. They had great working hours, food and amenities but it seemed to me that they were just asking to get nuked. I wanted to avoid any offensive or defensive installations. This led me to investigate the less mainstream cults. There was one group that was absurdly obsessed with buttholes, and to join, you had to have a ring inserted in your anus so that the spirit of God could flow in and out more freely, or something like that. I chose a more bread-and-butter, standard-issue sex cult instead. Its only drawback was that it was on the same island as the butthole cult, and they were always trying to break into our compound in the middle of the night and kidnap someone who ended up getting a lengthy enema and brainwashing treatment. Their treatments must have been very effective because they had a 60% conversion rate. Okay... Why did I write this? <coughs> hmm. I was trying to write it quickly. It was trying to write from a man's perspective, Alex's father. It's not the whole book that's this perspective. Um, 
that I was trying to give a different look at her, at who she was. And I think the next perspective in this book was her ex-boyfriend and and her her friend from college is another perspective. And one of her bosses, we get that one too. So it's all set in her world, yet it's um, it's a little different. I don't think it's stressful to read. I think it's probably relaxing to read. But as the author, it's a little bit confusing to look back on and just ask myself, what the heck was I thinking? But in the end, what I, I do feel good about this because I've been expanding this world. So all of these books, they're set in the same place and the events are all tied to the same basic timeline and I'm just getting different vantages on it and I find that kind of fun. It makes the world feel really kind of real after a while and I think it's fun to read because of that. So... Thank you for watching um, my reaction to a book I wrote not too long ago. It's strange how you feel about things that you make like this. Until next time.